Hello. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. We have Ryan uh, talking about roles, privileges, and security in Postgres. Ryan, All right. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, I always get to put this at the end of my deck, but it's fairly easy. I'm Ryan Booz everywhere. Um, I try to be. My blog is Software and Booze, uh, which you'll, you'll see some stuff time to time. And I will try and get this updated version uh, in my repo, hopefully before the end of the day, and I will do my best to link it to the website. They have a place for us to do that. So, quick agenda. Um, roles and privileges. It's something we have to deal with everywhere, whether it's in Postgres, whether it's on your machines, whether it's in your applications. And it's something that, as I've done more and more in Postgres, helped users in Postgres, help people transitioning into using Postgres, understanding roles and how the privileges that, that we can inherit and use really interact with things. So that's what we're going to try and go top down. It's, every time I run through this, I'm actually writing a chapter of a book on this, and it's like trying to figure out the exact order because of all the pieces that have to come together. So we'll start with the building blocks, get through roles, talk a little bit about inheritance, which is really important. And for me, really it's about getting down to object ownership because I think that's where most people get confused and have a difficult time using Postgres at scale with a lot of people. So quick disclaimers. We won't cover everything. There's just too much, right? Um, but everything I cover in here should be applicable. It is applicable to anything uh, that's currently in support version, which is 12 plus. Honestly, it should work with anything from 9.6 forward. Um, aside from one or two things that, that have been added over the last few uh, releases. So let's go ahead and dive in. So first, the building blocks. So there's four pieces here. One is just, I want to talk about the building blocks, and we're going to talk about roles, security, and ownership, just to get you through as we go. So uh, if you have been using Postgres for a while, you may or may not understand this, but it's really critical to understanding how privileges and roles work. And so if you are in a hosted environment, this may not matter to you. But again, it's, it's really important to understand. So as you create roles, objects, and the ownership, and the privileges, this is how this works. So we have, if this is a, raw, a, a you know, bare bones server, we have a cluster. Uh, I and mean, we have a host, you know, whether it's a VM, whether that's bare metal. And on that host, you can have as many running Postgres clusters as you want. So we just had to talk about clustering, but the actual process running on the host it's called a cluster. If you go to the documentation, that's what you'll see. So we can have multiple clusters. They just have to run on different ports. And then once you have a cluster, now this should make sense. Really, there's a lot that goes on in there. But as far as this talk goes, the two pieces that are really critical and really symbiotic to one another is roles and the databases, the objects that are contained therein. So these exist at the cluster level. Right, so roles are created at the cluster, databases are created at the cluster. And again, remember, for this talk, cluster is one instance of Postgres, All right, not many, many instances. Um, and then, like I said, the, the interplay between these is, is actually just a little bit more nuanced than I used to spend a lot of my time in SQL Server a number of years ago. And it's, it's similar, right? We're talking about roles or users and, and privileges. But the way that they rely on one another in Postgres, again, can be a nuance that not everyone picks up initially. So we'll try and talk that through. Essentially, just to show that everything in the database, everything we care about from an object, object perspective, has to be owned by a role. And so it cannot exist until a role exists, and then it includes a database. And so there's just this uh, back and forth uh, that we're trying to understand as we go. When you're in the cluster, every cluster has uh, what's called a PGHBA file, that is host-based authentication. And it's the first layer of authentication. So again, if you're running your own server, this exists, you have to do something with it. If you're in a hosted environment, most of this is taken care of for you if you're in a cloud vendor. Um, and, and I like to think of it almost like a firewall rule, right? So it's, it's a file that literally shows um, which hosts and roles can connect to what databases using what authentication method. And it's a matter of reading top down as a connection tries to happen into Postgres. It matches each of those properties. What host is this connection coming from? What is the role that's trying to connect? And what is the method they're trying to use? And the first one it finds, that is the role, that is the, the HBA uh, rule that it, that it lists. These things can be very, very long, right? But it's just left to right on each line. What type? Is it local? Is it host-based? There are a bunch of others. 
you know, which database, all databases, the users, addresses, and then methods, all right? So when it comes to methods, you've probably heard this if you've been around long enough, but their trust still exists. And so just avoid using trust, um, really at all costs. What that means is on that machine, if the host and the user matches, you're in. You don't have to, you're just trusted and, and move forward. It's not terribly secure, right? Um, and so, you know, in most environments, if it's not some kind of uh, central authentication, like uh, Kerberos or whatever that might be, most places do give you um, Scram 256 now. So Scram was developed, uh, I forget now, uh, five or six years ago, really uh, kind of took over, replaced MD5 and some other things. Uh, so Scram 256 is what we recommend if you're using password-based authentication. And just need to make your, uh, it's probably what you're using, but if you don't know, go ahead and look. All right, so that's just the building blocks. We have a host, we have a cluster running on it. We know the inside of the cluster, we have roles, databases, and some objects. So let's go ahead and talk about that first part. Once we've at least gotten through that host-based authentication, we have a host, a user, and a type. We've matched the rules, so now we're allowed to try and connect. Who are we connecting as? So roles. Obviously, own the database schema's objects, things like tables, functions, views, things you would expect within a database, all right? And roles own the database itself. There's a role that owns the database that's created. Roles have cluster-level privileges. It's, it's this nuance of thing we'll call attributes, and I'll show you in just a minute. Those are separate from the privileges that you get within a database, all right? But they're kind of, again, it's like the host level, what can you as a user do, as a role do, in this database, in this uh, cluster? And then you might be able to be granted uh, privileges to a database, they, they can be granted privileges to database schemas, objects, and so forth. Um, and then possibly, as we'll see in one second, some roles have the ability to grant their privileges and their, uh, um, yeah, they're privileges to other roles in the system. And we'll see why that's really important. So just to talk, I've been trying consistently to say roles over and over and over rather than users and groups. So in the SQL standard, role is, uh, is there and so is user and group. User, um, I might have the backwards, but um, user and group is, is also in the, in the standard. But starting with, I think it was 8.2, uh, we moved to just roles. So there's no real semantic difference between roles and groups. It doesn't do something magical. Uh, what we tend to say, what the, the convention is, when you create a role and it's allowed to actually log in to the cluster, we kind of consider that role a user. And if it's not allowed to log in, we consider that a group. Everything else about the roles can be consistent. They can all have privileges. They can all do a lot of things. They can own things. Even a role that can't log in can own something. And you'll see why we do that in just a little bit when it comes to inheritance. So you can do this. Uh, create user and create group does exist. They are simply aliases to create role. And so if you say create user, it behind the scenes does create role. Whatever uh, attributes you pass in, it will apply. And then by default, it will apply the, um, um, <laughs> the login automatically, right? And group will uh, apply no login so that you can't get in. So there's really no reason, it, it depends on your environment and how you work, but there's really no reason you can't do a create role um, consistently across the board. Uh, any of these will work, they'll get the exact same thing done, just recognize the first two are running create role under the covers. And so I keep talking about these attributes, right? So now we understand a little bit what roles are, you can apply attributes to the roles. So they are predefined settings um, that, again, are at the cluster level. That has nothing to do with the databases yet. And they map to this uh, catalog table called PG roles. So these are the attributes. I say Postgres 15. I think these have been the same attributes since Postgres 9.6. Um, well, one might have changed. I, I don't remember, to be honest with you. Um, the ones that we, I'm going to talk about just briefly through the rest of this, what most of you are probably concerned with as you are administering databases are the ones that are underlined. Can you log in or not? Is this role a super user or not? We'll talk about that in a minute. Can they create other roles? Can they create databases in this cluster? Is it password-based authentication? And then can they inherit privileges from other roles? 
The other three that are listed there, again, a little bit complex in, in connection limit. If you really want to set it, you can. Just recognize if you don't set those other couple uh, strings, the connection or the, the attributes, the strings or inherit, by default, roles will be able to inherit from other roles. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. And they have unlimited connections. If there are available connections, I can connect many times as that user from that method and so forth. All right? Any questions on roles? All right. Um, the one thing that I, I often forget to talk about, there is a way, again, depending on what you're doing and how you are administering Postgres, um, you can actually, for a role, set many of the, the settings that you could do within Postgres. So if you go into a running Postgres instance and you can do something like set search path, um, set JIT, you can actually alter a user and set that property so that every time they connect, and it has to be connection, uh, that property will get set for that session. So that can be really helpful. Sometimes you get lost in documentation, and it might be useful for what you do. Now, it could, you know, I just chose JIT here as an example. Um, JIT can be really good, and it can be really troublesome when you have complex queries that are, you know, lots of data. Maybe the JIT actually is not as helpful. And so maybe you have a, a report user in your database that's often running really complex reports, and you just don't realize that maybe JIT's one of the reasons that it's not being as efficient as it could be. So maybe with that user, you would turn off JIT. So you don't have to think about it anymore. Every time they connect, JIT would just be turned off for that session. All right, special roles. So how many of you have heard of the super user? All right, so most people have. If you've worked with Postgres, you've been warned about this thing called the super user. And most people, if you're learning, have logged in with the user Postgres, and they can do whatever they want, and they never think about why they can do whatever they want, and we move forward with life, and we forget. So you would think that someone who has access with super user would kind of be like our, you know, the superhero, the neighborhood friendly Superman that's always looking out for the benefit and good of everybody. But the reality is super user is a lot more like this, right? You can do anything, anywhere, destroy whatever you want, and no one can stop you. And so it means we have to be really careful with super user. And again, as Postgres has become more and more popular, more, uh, you know, the usage has increased, understanding what super user is needed for, which in many ways is often very little, um, compared to, quite honestly, some of the trouble you can get into with it, it's really valuable to know uh, what you can do and ways to get around it. So super user, uh, you get one super user created when the cluster is initiated. So when you say init DB, you get a user. That user has to be a super user because it, things have to be done. Roles are going to have to be created. Um, the process is running as that user. But it doesn't mean that you actually have to use that user moving forward. Uh, there's a lot of recommendations where you actually can change that user, Postgres, to no login, right? So you can't log in now. You can log in as a role that could set login if you really need to for some reason, right? So there's a lot of ways that it, it's necessary for some actions that we're going to do, but uh, it's just really powerful. So typically name Postgres, and it's that because when, uh, when we run an ITDB, the, uh, the user, the process that is running Postgres to init that DB will be the name of the super user that's created. So in most systems, when you install from an RPM package or something like that, um, it will be the, the Vrim keeps all of our RPM packages up, so give me a hand. Um, the, it's, it's Postgres user, right? In Linux, it's, just, it's created. Therefore, the super user is called Postgres. You can actually tell NetDB to use a different role if you want. It's create a different role and use it. But generally, it's Postgres unless you have a different environment. And it bypasses every security check everywhere in Postgres except for login, right? So as long as that host is allowed to log in and you're a super user, from that point forward, you can do whatever you want. All right, so it's kind of like root on Linux. So most cloud providers do not provide this to you. Now, there are some, if you are in your, a sandbox environment, like a, a, a private VM or something like that, you may get direct access and you may get super user. If you use AWS, Microsoft, Google, whatever your hosting provider might be, you do not get super user. Right? They give you something that is like super user. 
you know, we all, we trust him, right? So it's just enough power, but not so much that you can destroy the world. And so the recommendations, you'll find this in, in docs. Um, I actually forgot what page, and I tried to find it quickly, but there is this recommendation in docs, and then you'll see this elsewhere. If you are going to manage, and you're a DBA of a Postgres cluster, um, it's usually best practice to create, just as you would in Linux, right? Create a user that can do what you need it to do, but is not root. And so in this case, we say something super user-like. At a bare minimum, they probably should be able to create other roles that will allow them to create roles, alter roles, and so forth. And they probably need to be able to create databases. But if they're not super user, they can't just go to any database, delete, remove, modify anything they want. And that's what you're trying to prevent. So it allows user management, but um, a little bit safer. Now, there are still some things that you may not be able to do if you are not a super user. There are some extensions that require being a super user to install. Now, the team consistently has worked, we'll, we'll talk about at the very end, about a, a providing new roles that can allow us to do some of these things that used to require super user. All right, and so I know that that's one that's been talked about, for instance. Uh, it used to be checkpoint. You could only run a checkpoint if you uh, had the privilege or you had super user. And so now there's a, a, a privilege uh, with 16 that allows you to run a checkpoint, even if you're not a super user. So, All right, so we have roles, both regular roles, super duper roles, and the kind of roles we want for managing our database. And then for those roles, we need to apply privileges. And at the heart of it, we've just, by creating roles, all we've done is been able to log in. And so if we want to actually do something in the database, we have to understand privileges in Postgres. So obviously there are a set of access rights, database to databases, schemas, objects. Now when I say objects, I generally mean things like tables, views, functions, store procedures, you know, things that have ownership of some sort. Okay, not every single thing in, the, in a Postgres database is actually owned by an owner, a role. Most things are. They can be granted, privileges can be granted or revoked. You've probably been used to this either in Postgres or elsewhere. And then the one thing I, it's, as we get to one or two things at the end, it's easy to forget that any time you run a script and it says grant something to somebody, it only impacts things that exist right then. So a lot of people uh, I've seen will start a database up, they'll do something like grant all, select all uh, to all tables on public to whatever. And they think, great, I've solved my problem for the rest of time. And then they create a new table and no one can read from it. When you explicitly run a grant or revoke statement, it only impacts the things that exist right then. All right, so just keep that in mind. So here are the privileges, uh, 15 and 16. I actually thought I went through and changed all of those to 16, so I must have missed that. Um, the, these are all the things that we can set. Now the ones I have underlined, starting with Postgres 15, are the ones that are essentially provided by default unless you modify anything. So every single user, again, super user aside, unless you've modified something, every role will get these four privileges on any database on the public schema. And the reason is um, there's this role called public. It's basically hard-coded in the Postgres. You can't remove it. You can't get rid of it. And every role gets is granted membership into public. And again, most roles inherit. And so when you have that kind of role, you automatically get the connect privilege, right? So I've passed HBA, I provided an actual password that works, but if I don't have the connect privilege, I can't connect. So I can turn off connect to a database. I might have multiple databases, but this user does not get to connect to that one. That's really the usage. Again, I can connect, but if I can't use it, I can't do anything. You can actually connect to a Postgres database, get a valid connection, you're connected, and then you want to do anything, select whatever it might be, and you're just denied. And that's where usage comes in. Temporary tables and then executing things like store procedures and so forth and functions. Um, now, if you're using Postgres 14 or below on the public schema, you also have the create privilege through public on the public schema. And so that we realized uh, is, gets to be some of a security hole, all right? And the reason is, 
in this case, I don't want to get into too much, but if you create something uh, on any schema, so on the public role, that's where most people were creating things. A lot of us still don't use schemas in our applications. We just create tables, and by default, they go into the public schema. And so if somebody created a store procedure and they weren't super user, there are ways, actually not that difficult if you know what you're doing, to create a function, somehow get someone with elevated, elevated privileges to run it, and you can get super user. All right? Another talk that I like to do. But, um, it, so we realize that. And so basically, starting with 15 and above, create is not provided through public to the public schema. So you have to be explicitly granted. Every role has to be explicitly granted create. And then when you create your own schemas, you have to grant create to other roles if you want them to be able to do it. So recognize that change. Now, the one caveat here is if you've been upgrading 12, 13, 14, 15, when you upgrade to 15, it doesn't take away the privilege from, from roles that already existed. Again, all of this is point in time, right? I applied the role at some, uh, the privilege at some point in the past. I have to explicitly do something to modify that. And so uh, security best practice, I've been talking about public a little bit. And again, this is more what has come around, it's gotten a lot of uh, attention over the last few years, which is there's just this potential for bad things to happen on the public schema. And so most folks, most uh, uh, advice you'll get is to revoke all privileges from the public schema from the public role. Again, you can't get rid of the role. So you want to remove all privileges from public. And then, per database, you probably want to remove privileges um, specific you know, to the database itself. And what that would mean is, again, that comes to the connect. right? So you have to be able to connect to a database. Well, if I don't revoke all privileges, any user, they're part of public. If public has connect, then they can connect to that database. And so that allows you, this just means and then you have to be more explicit with every database, every schema, and so forth. All right, you'll find this in a number of blog posts, people talking about um, security, and especially two years ago with Postgres 15, there was a lot of news around this. Now, granting privileges is hopefully pretty straightforward. The, the docs pages on grant and revoke are really good. They go into uh, a lot of detail on all the privileges, what it means when I say I grant someone select. What does that mean? When I grant someone delete. What does that mean? What is it just delete rows or does it allow me to do something else? And so there's a lot of good documentation, but you grant something to an object to a role uh, and then you can name a you should you name a schema whether it's public, whether it's all, could be all schemas or specific schema. So in this case we're simply granting create. So now this admin can create something. Uh, you know, they can use and create in the schema that I've, I've created. But then we're going to create a, a junior role, uh, and I, the junior dev role, and we're granting uh, select, insert, and update. But they can't delete, they can't create in the database. Um, in theory, they've been given uh, usage on the database. I missed that out here. I should have had that in that line. Now, there are other ways to do this. So, again, just remember, explicit grants only affect current database objects. So I'm going to do a quick demo uh, at the end of this to show you all of this very quickly and hopefully uh, you know, cut, tie all the pieces together. Again, these pages are really good. And so it just answers all the questions, every privilege. Uh, and if you don't know, if you go to the Postgres documentation, there's a search box up top. And it works pretty well. And so you can just simply say grant, grant privilege, grant, revoke, and it will come right up. All right, so we have the cluster. We understand we have roles and objects and databases on the cluster. There are some attributes and privileges given to a role at the cluster level. Then we get to the uh, databases themselves. Now we have privileges, which we can grant to roles for all the various types of things within the database. But if you notice on this slide, if I had to do this for every user, this gets really frustrating and complex. Now, quite honestly, this is probably why a lot of people myself included, it's just easier to use super user. Just log in with that one user, do everything you need to do, because I trust myself, I'm not gonna do anything bad. But the better way forward is to deal with inheritance. So you may have noticed, you may have not, that uh, earlier on, this is one of those attributes, uh, one of the privileges, I'm sorry, the attributes to a user. Do you inherit privileges or not? Now, it doesn't matter 
if you aren't granted membership into some other uh, role that would apply privileges, you could receive privileges from. So roles can be granted membership into other roles. That's why there really is no group and user difference here. It's just whether they, you know, again, we say whether they can log in or not log in. But if you create the roles that cannot log in, treat them as groups, you can apply all of your privileges to those groups in ways that make sense and then grant uh, ownership into those roles from other, um, for other roles. So this is really the preferred method for managing it. You, what you would expect in a, you know, whether it's Linux, Windows, whatever it is, you have groups, you have users, Gr users can be part of multiple groups. It's exactly what we're talking about here. But you have to go to some effort. So again, just a really quick example, we hate, we're creating a senior dev user uh, role, they can inherit, report user, they can inherit, and then we create two groups because they can't log in, all right? And so we just, we explicitly say no inherit. Now, you don't have to do that for groups, but it can get a little bit messy trying to figure out exactly where everything's coming from. So a lot of wisdom is your groups, let them be separate and apply the groups you need to other, to your actual user roles. And then I've said, hey, grant, insert, update, delete on all tables to the read-only privilege. Now, it's, I should have, uh, to the admin privilege. I was like, wait, that's not read-only. Um, to the admin privilege, right? So right here. And then we have grant select uh, all tables to this read-only privilege, right? But those are my two groups. They can't log in. So how's this going to help me? Well, you can then grant membership into those other groups. So I say grant admin and read-only priv to the senior dev, and then only grant read-only priv to the junior dev. And so essentially what that looks like is this. Those two roles both have read-only privilege, but the senior dev has, now also has his other privilege, so you kind of keep building on top of that. So it's a great way to be able to apply the kinds of privileges you need across many roles. Uh, and then if you need to update something, you update one object, the group role, and it will be applied to all of the users that are inheriting from that user. Any questions on inherit? What that looks like, yeah. Oh, not, not really on inherit, but for super user in the Postgres, it has all privileges for you if you create extra users. They will have the same privileges as Postgres, or Postgres has hidden privileges extra. Okay, the question is, if the super user creates roles, does, do those roles get the same privileges as the super user? No. 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 If you create super users, so with super privileges, that they get the same privileges that internal Postgres has created at the beginning. Okay, misunderstood. If you create a role and you grant it super user, yeah. they're a super user, just like works exactly the same as what you would expect Postgres to do. Yep. It's a flag in the database, and if, it doesn't matter what the name of the role is. If it is a super user, you're a super user. Have fun. Don't destroy, okay? Um, but maybe that is the fun, right? No, I'm kidding. Uh, test your backups. Okay. So, great. We have, you know, just trying to build down through this. We have our cluster. We've created roles. We understand what those privileges look like. We understand that there is... Um, you know, this, this level, the roles and the privileges they get, but then we get to object ownership. And honestly, this is when I decided I started to need to dig into roles in Postgres because I was using super user for everything. I didn't care, right? And then I actually started to manage an application with multiple users, a lot of devs in a, you know, one environment, a couple different users for various applications that were connecting from another environment. And all of a sudden I was like, what is going on? Because this is not what I thought was going to happen. And that's when I had to really start to dig in. So that's why all of the other stuff leading up to this is important for me as an application developer or running or helping to teams of application developers effectively use Postgres. So object ownership. Whoever creates the object, whatever role you are currently logged in as or that session is currently acting as, when that object gets created, they are the user table, function, view, you know, on and on and on. Even a database. When I create a database, if I had privilege to create the database, that database is now owned by me, not by Postgres, not by some other user. 
So it's really, that's just the first thing you've got to understand. Now, the owner of the object is essentially like a super user of the object. Right? They're not a super user, but I own the object. I'm the only one that can actually do a lot of things on that object, unless I've granted other privilege. And there are some things only I can do, or a super user. So I like to think of this as principle of least privilege. When I create something, the way that Postgres works, it says, we don't want anyone to do anything. You have to tell me, Postgres, the, the, the cluster, what everyone else should be able to do to this object. I don't care if they're part of some group that has access to this thing and you're both part of the same group. I don't care. They have to be given explicit uh, privilege in some way. So that's kind of the first place that you start to get confused. If you happen to have multiple devs and you're on a test database and you're all part of the same group and all of a sudden dev one creates something and dev two says, oh, let me go just see what you did. And like, access denied. You're like, what? We're on the test server. What are you talking about? And this is what it gets down to is object ownership and understanding that. Now, again, roles, there are some roles that can actually, um, you know, grant, uh, so, yeah, default, sorry, default privileges. So we're going to talk about default privileges in just a minute. And that's where kind of the power for managing application and creation of objects and management of objects can be really helpful. So this is what I showed earlier. Hopefully you can see, and I actually forgot to make this point early on, and I apologize for that. The one unique thing for Postgres with me, coming from a different database, is that although the roles are created at the cluster level, I cannot connect to the Postgres cluster unless I can connect to a database. Every connection is to a database. And so I might have the right password, might have the right host, might have the right role, but if I don't have access, I don't have literal connect privilege to any database, I can't get in. So there's this thing that like, I almost, it, I, I said symbiotic earlier, like roles and objects are separate, but what's a little bit unique about Postgres, again for me, is you, they need to exist together. That's why when you initiate a Postgres cluster, you get one database and one super user because that super user can now connect to the database that's named after itself, blah, blah, blah. So there's this nuance. Now the problem though is, if all of my users are creating all these different objects down here, right, they're all owned by different people. And as I said earlier, the owner of the object is, is like the super user of that object. And so then you start to get into conflict of who can use what, and what can you do in that object. So what I've learned over the years, and I work for a company called Redgate. You may have heard of the Flyway uh, application. It's migration, schema-based migration. Redgate owns that uh, product and manages the open source uh, portion of that. And we see lots of, of folks that are moving from other databases to Postgres. Yay, we're super excited about that. But again, understanding this ownership principle is so important. So they will you know, go and create. They don't even realize what uh, owner they're connecting and running these migration scripts as. And if the migration scripts don't explicitly modify ownership, all of a sudden they have objects in the database that are run by multiple people because different people were running these migration scripts. And then you get into a big issue because now someone wants to modify this table, we've turned off login for super user, and only that user can modify the table, and you just get into this like roundabout, right? So what we tend, what I tend to like to tell people is particularly as you get up to your production database. Now with Flyway, what we would say, when we help folks do this, we go through you know, dev and we have a staging server. And often what we'll say, and I'm gonna show you default privileges in a minute, is create, run all of your scripts. Now again, if you do a dump, you'll see that after every object in a dump file, if you do the, the script, it, Postgres explicitly changes the uh, owner. Now that's also where you get those error messages if you don't have that owner on your machine. But the object was created. Whoever creates the object, it doesn't matter if it's for a backup script. If you ran a backup script from your server and those objects were owned by Joe, and you go run it on the other server connected as Mary, all of those objects would be connected as, would be created as Mary if you didn't explicitly change the ownership now. So that's what, it's like this nuance, right? So we tend to recommend when you are actually going to production or even your staging server, you run those scripts as one group role, and you make sure that group, 
you know, doesn't have things like select and delete and whatever. They're just allowed to create the objects. But you have other roles that are granting permission into those objects then in a way that is accessible. And the, the beauty of doing that is you can still switch to that role. You'll see that in the demo I'll do in just a minute. So if you needed to modify something about that, you can still set into that role and then you know exactly which role you need to get to to do the modification. So there's just a nuance here. And the, the value to this uh, comes with default privileges. So as you'll see in the demo, again, I create an object like a table. Only I can modify that table. I don't, unless you're a super user, I don't care if we both are part of the same group roles. Only I can modify that table unless we set it to a role that both of us are a part of and then both of us can, be, uh, can switch into. So this is just a really simple example and I'll show you another one in the demo. Default privileges are a way to say when I, as this user, so I'm connected, you guys are, is everything okay? Okay, they're staring at me like I'm doing something wrong. Um, the, so I create uh, default privileges, I'm altering them, and I'm saying grant select on all tables to this, the role public. Now it could be any role, right? But I'm saying the public role. Now any time I create a table, if I had gone ahead of time and removed all the privileges, whatever, any time I, as whoever, whatever role I'm running that command as, every time I create a table from this point forward, everyone would be able to select because everyone's a member of public. Right, does that make sense? If I didn't do this, every time I create an object, I then have to explicitly grant the roles. That gets really tiresome. Now the only nuance here, and I have been dealing with this, so again, Redgate has been doing a lot with Flyway and Postgres, and I've been trying to help them understand, that only exists for, again, when I create the object. If I later go and modify this default privilege, Nothing changes about the objects I created earlier. You still have to go back and grant whatever you just modified to all of those other objects, right? But it's super helpful. So from a migration perspective, to just ease the management, what we tend to do is say, hey, make a group role that you, you know, certain people are a part of, so they can set to that role and modify the objects if they need to. Um, but then you know the owner of all the objects, and it's not necessarily the Postgres user. That's what most people end up doing on a cloud host environment or something like that. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, just about syntax. So first we have uh, actually uh, what pre uh, who has privileges on equal sign and that what privileges and who has given these privileges, correct? Exactly. So this says that the user Postgres, the owner of this uh, specific default privilege, uh, any time the Postgres creates a table, where it just says equal, that's public, that's all. And so they have read access. The question was, I apologize, you know, what, basically what's being shown here. So when I create the default privilege, you know, the equal with nothing in front of it just means public. And then you could name multiple roles. In this case, it's just the owner, obviously, has all the privilege. And they always have all the privilege, right? Yeah. Um, that's a great, so the question is, is it possible to have wild cards? And I think you're saying, like, uh, if I create a default privilege, and I, I don't know if I said this earlier, and I apologize, this is per database, right? So if I create the default um, in the database, um, sorry, uh, I don't think there is. I mean, again, you can create things like, in this case I said uh, on tables, you can do things like on tables, on views, so you get a lot of the, the objects, uh, but I don't believe there's a way to say like a wild card across multiple things that so I know of. So, great question. The question is, could you do this in the template? Yeah, you could. You could create your roles in the template database. You could, for the roles that you want to use, set your default privileges, and if that all works out and you have all the roles and owners, you, every database you create is going to get that stuff. All right. I just really want to quickly uh, run this demo. It's about five minutes. And so I, just so you can see it, because sometimes for me at least, that just helps me see what's happening, right? It's, it's one thing to see slides, but just really quickly. So providing object access, because this is, again, this is where I see so many of the actual problems happen. When you don't give someone super user, all of a sudden things just go haywire. And so you can either explicitly grant access every time to every kind of object and go for it. 
lot of work, do what you want to do. You can alter default privileges, and now any time something is created in that database by that role, including something like migration scripts, they will inherit these privileges for whatever roles you assigned. You can then set role in the app. I'm going to show you that. So in Postgres, you can say set role, which so I could connect to the database. I could set, change my role for that session to the owner of the table so I can do something with it and modify the privileges and so forth. Uh, and then in Postgres 14 and above, we're starting to get some of these other attributes to do more. I talked earlier about this. This is the object ownership thing in uh, security. Again, there's a number of talks on this. I think I have an old one, maybe linked on my blog somewhere. Um, so let's go ahead and quickly do the demo. So I have an empty database. This is going to be really quick. All right, so I'm using dBeaver. I just like it of, uh, in demos because of the um, color coding stuff. It's just a little bit easier for me to see and show. So the current role, I'm currently connected as Postgres. So this session I initiated as the Postgres super user. And I'm going to create a new schema. And I still have to do all the things I want to do, so I'm going to create a, a developer role. Now it says no login, so what kind of role is this? We consider this a group role. And so the set role, if you say none, that will change the, the ownership of the, of the current session back to whoever initiated that session. Right? So as Postgres, I just had this here because I think earlier I had set to something else. And so for that role, we're going to do this. We're going to grant select, insert, update, delete on all tables in the demo app schema to this group role called developer. Now, it can't log in, so it can't really do anything, right? And then we're going to say grant, create, and usage to this role. And then we're going to create our developer users. It doesn't really matter. You know, anything here doesn't matter. Oops, I am not hitting. Am I hitting the right keys? Oh, my apologies. Uh, so in dbeaver, I can just say control, enter, and it will run the commands. So I've created two users, and now the magic. I can grant those users access, privilege, into that role, that group. Now, at this moment, now that they've been given granted access, what does that mean about their privilege? I have not granted any privileges to those users yet. But what do they now have? Select, insert, update, delete on all tables, and they have create and usage, right? So now, without doing anything else, they can use that schema. And we can see if I, uh, so now I can set role. So this, I could have multiple tabs. I could have connected it as dev1 on one tab and dev2 in another tab. In Postgres, when you say set role to a role, uh, it's basically like switching user. There's one or two things that don't happen at that moment. One is, remember earlier I said you alter uh, you can alter some settings. Those things don't get run when you do set role. But otherwise, if, if I'm allowed, I'm running a super user so I can do this. If I have membership in that role, I can set to it and act as that role for a little bit. And then I can go back. So I'm going to set to dev1. So this is as if I had connected as dev1 to the database now. And I'm going to create a table in that new schema because I can. Again, we haven't granted anything to that user explicitly except membership in this group. And now we'll see, oop, I need to create the table, don't I? What's that? I didn't, what? Uh, so here, I'll just drop this, because that's going to miss everything. Yes. <laughs> ah. All right. Come on. Yes. Does not exist. Okay, maybe I. Well, uh, if this doesn't go, then we'll just move on and I'll show you what I can. All right, there we go. So now I can see that, oh my goodness, my hands are not hitting the right keys here. So I have this table, and the owner is Postgres. So now I set my role to dev2, and I try and alter that table. Of course I can't. I don't have permission to do that because Postgres created it. They didn't give me permission. 
So I'm going to go ahead and uh, drop that table. I could also just uh, alter the uh, I could just alter the owner. But what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to set the role to developer. This is the, now again it can't log in, but I can set the role to I have access to developer, or I'm super user. So I'm now I'm, now I'm developer. I create that same table, and now we can see that it's owned by developer. Okay, what does that really do for us? Well, now I can go back to Dev2. And I can try and alter that table. And of course, this does work. <laughs> Maybe I didn't. What's that? Oh, I didn't. OK. Let me just talk you through this rather than, uh, man, I literally ran through this five times today. My apologies. Um, the, the big point here is, as we go down through, as long as the user is a member of that group, and that group created the objects, I can do the privileges I'm allowed to do on that object then. All right, so it's a way to let me do some stuff. Now, some things I might not be able to do, I might have to switch into that role to do some alter, things like that, right, if I want to alter the object itself. Um, and so, yeah, I see, man, that's really crazy. Uh, anyway. The, the main, <laughs> hate when a demo fails, right? Uh, the main point is, there's like two recordings of this. You can see this run through if you want. Um, it's just to say again, you have to grant specific privileges. I was going to come down here to the default privileges and show again that once you set something like a default privilege, as long as you create those objects with that role, they will get whatever privileges you uh, said to, that, uh, to the roles that you provided. And so it's just a way. So in this case, it was just a read on the report user. I want them to be able to read from every table. If I'm not using Postgres 15, or 14 and above, I would have to make sure that they have select on all the tables. Setting a default, default privilege is one of the easiest ways to do that. All right, so last thing, go back. Demo fail. Uh, we'll have to get that another time. Just to really quickly bring up predefined roles. Um, so predefined roles have existed for a while. In Postgres 14 and above, there's a lot that's been done to try and do things, uh, provide roles that, for management purposes, so you don't have to be a super user. I gave the example earlier of checkpoint. Right? So now you can give someone this checkpoint, uh, we call them predefined roles. You can grant them membership into that role, and then that user could run a checkpoint. Uh, things like read all data. This has been a problem for a long time. So starting with Postgres 14, I think it was, uh, we had the read, the read all tables and the write all tables. So if you just wanted someone to be able to read all tables, in this case in all databases, because it's a, um, in the database, I mean, it's a, it, it's a role there, um, you could now create this, you know, give, grant them access into this. Here are the current predefined roles. Um, this is updated to 16. Uh, I believe the one that's different here, I knew earlier and right now I can't find it. But this is where you can do things like read servers. So a lot of uh, monitoring programs now require you to be able to read the log or to read files from disk. Well, if you don't want super user to connect, you could grant your monitoring role something like read server files so that they can still read the files without being a super user. All right? That's the end of it. I really apologize for the demo. I, was, I love giving that demo, and I don't know what I did. But anyway, uh, if you have questions, I'll take one, and then we're going to have to be done. Yeah. Great, yeah, great question. For those who are still here, the question, is there like a log kept of transitions of, I guess the mic is off, uh, there's, is there a log kept when you grant things off and on, right? I had this default privilege, and then I modified it. There isn't. You would have to do that in some way, um, maybe through scripture if you do.